Hello. Today I'm going to talk to you about a paper that I've uh, published a few years ago with Harry, Richard, Michal, and Florian. And the story of this paper uh, goes about like this. So Michal visited us in Amsterdam and he put a challenge to us, which was the following. Suppose you're doing a computation that requires more memory than the free memory you have available. So you have some free memory and you have some memory which is full, full of stuff, files that you don't want to lose maybe. And you, um, and of course, um, if you like to have more memory, you can always try and compress the full memory, use the memory that you freed up and then decompress it. Uh, but of course, there's this scenario where the contents of the memory have already been compressed, maybe they're incompressible. And then the challenge that Michal put for, forward to us was to prove that this extra full memory is useless. So first thing we did was to try and formalize this. Um, and so we came up with this model of computation uh, where this challenge could be made precise. So let L denote the class of problems or functions which can be computed using a logarithmic amount of working memory and uh, we define this complexity class CL to be the class of functions which can be computed using a logarithmic amount of working memory plus let's say a polynomial amount of full memory so this is the picture so uh, so n is the input size and maybe we have a Turing machine that has order log n free uh, working memory and a polynomial amount of memory which is full. Now the computation needs to obey the following promise which is of course you can use the full memory to help you in your computation you can write whatever you want in it uh, but you have to promise me that by the time that you uh, that the computation comes to its output the content of the full memory has to be restored to its initial value. So by the time you output whatever you need to output, the contents of the full memory uh, need to have been restored. And now the question, the challenge, uh, was to prove that these two classes are the same. That if I have, uh, that L equals CL. Uh, and, and for this question, uh, there's kind of, there's very obvious reason why one might think that these, these two classes are the same. Uh, of course, there's the sheer intuition of it, uh, that what possible use could you make of a memory which is full? And this was kind of what we thought that we couldn't use, so, so that's actually how the challenge was framed. If you try to work a bit more on how you could prove that these two classes are the same, you could come up with the following pseudo-argument. At any step of the computation, the mutual information between the input and the tape contents is still order log n. So in some sense the algorithm only remembers log n bits of the input. So we can try to prove that these two classes are the same by maintaining a compressed representation of these log n bits of information uh, and, and you update it as the Turing machine would do the computation, you just update this compressed information and you work with that. In hindsight, there's a couple of reasons why one might think that these two classes are different. And, uh, well, the first reason is that, so we have this full memory, right? So either we may compress its contents and use the f space that we freed up, or we can't compress its contents. And, but in that case, we have something incompressible. And it's known, complexity theory already knows that if we have an incompressible string, then maybe we can use this string to de-randomize a certain algorithm. Okay, that's one reason. Another reason is because of Barrington's theorem. It shows something rather surprising when it comes to use of memory. It shows that log depth bounded fan in circuits can be computed uh, with constant amount of memory. That's roughly what it says. So this is also unexpected and highly non-trivial, so maybe we can use similar tricks in order to show that these two classes are different. 
So with regards to this question, we used to think that, yes, these two classes are the same, but now we actually think they're not the same. And the reason we think that is because of several theorems we've been able to prove. One of them is that uh, RL, the randomized, uh, the, the, the set of problems solved uh, using log space uh, with randomization, that's contained in CL. And we have a proof of this that uses this compressor to randomize idea. This is an unpublished proof, and the reason it's unpublished is because we actually have a stronger theorem that subsumes this, which is a theorem that shows that TC1, the class of problems which can be solved by circuits that have threshold gates and logarithmic depth, that this class is contained in CL as well. This is proven using a Barrington-like argument, and we were actually a bit lost on uh, this L versus CL problem before Richard Cleave pointed out to the rest of us that, well, we have this theorem of his, this old theorem of his, uh, that could maybe uh, be used for this. And, um, and this theorem of his is actually the same kind of argument, uh, proven by the same kind of argument as Barrington's theorem. We'll see the theorem later. Uh, so, so one fact is that, you know, all these classes, non-deterministic log space, counting log space, and RL itself, and a few others, are contained in TC1. And so, uh, you know, this, late, this second theorem subsumes the first. Uh, there's a general belief that TC1 is not contained in L. I mean, I haven't, you know, probed every complexity theorist, but, you know, I believe it. And, you know, people are, tend to believe that that's the case. And under this belief, it should follow, it follows that um, CL is not contained in L. So under this belief, there is some non-trivial use that you can make of a memory which is full. And I find that uh, remarkable. Now, if you look at all these classes, um, there is some doubt. So people, people aren't very sure which of these classes are contained in log space. Uh, some people, so, so they're kind of on the edge on whether this class NL is contained in log space. But I think that by the an RL, people tend to believe that actually it is contained in log space. But by, I think that by the time you reach sharp L, this counting L class, most complexity theorists would tend to think that it's already uh, outside, it already sits outside of log space. And so today we're going to do a full proof that this class sharp L is contained in CL. So let me start with some definitions. L is the class of functions which can be computed by deterministic Turing machines which are allowed to use order log n cells of working memory. Now sharp L is the class of functions which are computed by counting the number of accepting paths in a non-deterministic Turing machine which also uses log n work memory. Now if you're not comfortable with these two definitions that's okay because it turns out that instead of thinking about the complexity classes themselves we can think about the problems, the computational problems, which are complete for these classes. So for L, the complete problem would be undirected connectivity. So given an undirected graph G with n vertices and two vertices S and T of this graph, is there a path between S and T? For sharp L, the complete problem is the counting walks problem. So I again give you an undirected graph G with n vertices and two vertices S and T, now I'm asking you to count the number of different walks of length n, say, which exist between s and t. So a walk is different from a path in that a walk through a graph can self-intersect, it can have loops. Counting the number of paths is actually a difficult problem, but counting the number of walks is not. There's actually a polynomial time algorithm, a simple one, to solve this problem. So counting walks given an undirected graph G with n vertices, count the number of walks between S and T of length n. Here's a simple claim. Let M be G's adjacency matrix. So the ij entry of M is 0 if there's no edge between i and j, and is 1 if there's an edge between i and j. Then if you take the nth power of M, and you look at the st entry, then this is exactly the number of length n walks between S and T. This is simple to check, you just look at the expression for matrix multiplication. Now if you look really carefully at that expression, you'll realize that 
the maximum number of walks of length n in an in a graph with n vertices can never exceed 2 to the n squared. So if you do your matrix multiplication modulo 2 to the n squared, then the outcome uh, of m to the power n will be exactly the same. So as a corollary, it follows that if CL can compute m to the n over the ring of n by n matrices with n square bit entries, then sharp L is contained in CL. This is because counting walks will be contained in CL and that's a complete problem for sharp L. So this is what we're going to show. We're going to show that in CL we can compute this m to the power n. Let's do a little detour into an algebraic model of computation that has this notion of using a full memory. So we call this model transparent programs. Uh, so, so it's a machine model. So suppose you have registers over some ring K. So K is some ring and, uh, and each of these register holds some value in the ring. So you have N read only input registers and you have N read write work registers. Now a program is a sequence of instructions where each instruction is of this form so you go to work register ri and you either add or subtract to it u times v where u and v are either constants in the ring or other registers be it work registers or input registers but they're different than ri so you can't have ri in these two now in order to for for you to say that such a program computes a function f then it needs to happen that at the start of the computation, there is some value in these registers. So you cannot assume that the value, the initial value of the work registers is zero. So R1 will have some value tau1, R2 will have some value tau2, and so on. And you cannot assume that these are zero. And it must always happen that at the end of the computation, R1, say, must have value tau1 plus f of x. And that's what it means for a program in this model to compute f. An important property of these straight line programs is that every program is reversible. So if I have this program say, I can reverse it simply by flipping the order of instructions and then switching the pluses with the minuses. And the reason this works is because these u's and v's that are part of the instruction are never equal to the register that's being changed. So after executing this instruction, u, u double prime and v double prime remain unchanged so if I just subtract the same value off, I go back to the state that I ha had before applying this instruction, and then I just keep doing that until the very end. Now let me prove to you an old result by Michael Benor and Richard Cleave. Here's a definition. An algebraic formula over the ring K is either a variable, or a constant in the ring, or a sum of two formulas, or a product of two formulas. Now, Benor and Cleave have this, this theorem, the, the Benor-Cleave theorem, which says that for any formula one, F, there's a three-register transparent straight-line program which computes, which, which is the following computation. So it, it changes register Ri, and it either adds or subtracts to it U times F. Here, I is one of the three registers, and U is either a constant or some register Rk, which is different than I. Furthermore, this program does not change any other register. So it might use the other registers, but it always returns them to their value, to the value that they had at the beginning of, of the execution. So the only register that ends up being changed is Ri. Let's prove this by induction. So if you have either a variable or a constant, then actually the, this, this program is just one of the basic instructions that we allowed in our transparent programs. Addition is very simple. If you have a program that adds u times f to ri, so it takes whatever initial value ri had and it adds u times f, then you just concatenate it with a program that does that adds u times g. And then by distri distributivity, uh, you get u times f plus g added to ri. Multiplication is a little trickier. So you first start by adding u times f to rj. So rj is some register other than ri. And if you do that, 
then Rj will have some value tau j, which is its initial value, plus u times f. Then you go to Ri and you add to it Rj times g. And if you do that, you're going to get some three terms. So you're going to get tau i, which is the initial contents of register Ri. And then you get tau j times g, because you have this term in Rj and you're multiplying it with g. And then you have what you want. You have u times f, which appears in Rj, times g. So you have this extra term that you don't like, so you want, you're going to want to get rid of it. So the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to clean up register Rj. So you do that, and after you do that, Rj returns to its initial value. And then you subtract from Ri Rj times g, and this will get rid exactly of this term and will leave you with exactly what you want. Now a few things can be observed about the programs that come up in this proof. One of them is that the size of the program P is roughly upper bounded by 4 to the depth of the formula F. This is because the multiplication part of the proof call, recursively calls the, the programs for the subformulas four times. And a corollary that we get of this is that if you have a ring k, then iterated k product can be computed by these transparent programs, uh, by programs that have polynomial size. So if you want to do the product of some matrix M, say, so let's say that k is the ring of matrices that we were looking above, uh, then the product of M by itself n times that has a formula of depth log n, where you just do pairwise multiplication. So it's a tree of pairwise multiplications. And this has depth log n. So there's, a, there's a, a straight line program over this ring of matrices k that has size um, n squared, 4 to, four to the log n, uh, for computing iterated matrix product. And uh, as a corollary of what we have seen above, um, Assuming that, you know, so you actually need to show that the product of such two matrix and the addition and subtraction can be done in log space, it will follow that iterated uh, matrix product is in catalytic uh, log space in this class CL. Uh, so if K is this, if this ring of, of n squared bit integer matrices, we get as a corollary that sharp L is contained in CL. Some more results that we have proven, and which I won't go over in this lecture, uh, it's possible also to prove that this more powerful class, VP, has such programs. And to do this, we need to extend the benor cleef theorem to circuits. So these circuits have NRE addition gates, but they have only binary product gates. And if we do something a little more clever, we can actually use these kind of constructions, these kind of uh, transparent programs to show that if your ring K is actually a commutative ring then you can do uh, exponentiation. So you can do exponential, so you can do log depth of exponentiation gates and you can actually use these exponentiation gates to simulate threshold gates and so this will give you log depth threshold circuits and that's how you prove that TC1 is can be simulated by uh, these programs. Another theorem that's interesting to prove is a lower is an upper bound. So you can show that catalytic log space or this the class CL can be simulated by uh, zero error randomized algorithms in polynomial time. And you so you basically have to show that these machines they will run in expected polynomial time, where the expectation is over the choice uh, over random content for the auxiliary tape. And there are a few more, a few other things have been proven. Uh, I, I will leave uh, a link uh, to, to, to such papers uh, below the video. The conclusion that you can make from this result is that, you know, assuming that you believe that TC1 is not contained in L, then you have to conclude that it's possible to use a full memory in a non-trivial way. Of course, much stronger results are needed for practical application. Uh, still, we now believe that CL is not contained in L. Now for some open problems. Let's start with general questions. 
Uh, I don't actually know if there's any practical use for these things. I would know how to prove that. I also so I noticed that this kind of transparent computing and this 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 CL computing, uh, so, so it's a reversible computation, but it, it has it doesn't make this assumption that the initial contents of the memory are set to zero. So it's kind of a more powerful slash more restricted form of computation, and I don't know if I, if there's some advantage to having this kind of uh, restriction. A question that actually has come up for me and my co-authors several times, and we, we haven't managed to establish some kind of clear connection, but our, our, our intuition says that there, it should be, it should exist. Is there some relationship between this transparent catalytic computation and homomorphic encryption? So some questions about the transparent program themselves. One question that is totally open is, can we do exponentiation over non-commutative rings? Or can we do n-fold multiplication over commutative rings? So instead of doing x to the n, you want to do x1 times x2 times etc. times xn. Uh, somehow you want to do this by using the subprogram that computes x1 up to xn only constant number of times. Another question is, how large must transparent programs be for circuits or formulas of size s? Uh, we have seen the Benoit Cleave theorem that we can have formulas, you know, a formula of size s has a catalytic program of size s squared. And it's possible actually to improve this to s to the 1 plus epsilon uh, by using uh, two papers. One paper shows that you can balance a formula of size s into a formula of size s to the 1 plus epsilon. Um, No, sorry, the first paper shows that balanced formulas have transparent programs of size s to the 1 plus epsilon, and then a later paper actually showed that you can balance any formula of size s into one of size s to the 1 plus epsilon, and putting these two papers together, you can conclude that any formula has a transparent program of size s to the 1 plus epsilon. And uh, it, I think it's wide open whether you can, this can be improved maybe to s log s instead of s to the 1 plus epsilon. That would be a very significant result, actually, I think. Uh, and the question is, can we prove s to the 1 plus epsilon or s log s for circuits? Another question, can you show any non-trivial upper bound for formulas computed by transparent programs? Uh, so, you know, we can, we, can, we can simulate these programs in polynomial time using polynomial space, but we don't know if we can do any better on any of the two fronts. So can we compute transparent programs in fixed polynomial space? Or is maybe CL contained in TC1 or NC2? Open questions. Some open questions about CL. Can we randomize the ZPP upper bound? Can we show that CL is contained in P? Wide open. Can we improve TC1 to NC2? So it's a log square depth uh, constant fan in formulas. This NC2 class contains TC1, but yeah, we couldn't prove this. The same question, can we prove any fixed polynomial uh, space upper bound for CL? And that's it. Thank you for your attention.